Luke number chapter 24 verses 44 through verse 53. And the King James text today reads, And he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. Oh, did you hear that now? Verse 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Luke 24, verses 44 through 53. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, You've laid an important word upon my heart today for the church of the living God. We live in a time, God, in the church when Pentecost is an afterthought. When the power of God has been traded in for programs and entertainment. When the people of God are walking without discernment and without a prophetic voice to guide them along the way. Oh, Master, how we need to hear from heaven in the church of the living God today. How we need a word from the Lord. I pray, God, today that you would quicken in my spirit this message that you have given me for this hour. Oh, Master, in the name of Jesus, help me to preach it. Lord, in a way, in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, in a manner that will allow the word of God to pierce like an arrow through the thickened flesh of men. Lord, that it might reach the heart. And it might bypass the mind, God, that it might not merely be words we hear in our hearing. But rather, O oh God, it might be a message from the Lord that we receive in our hearts. Anoint today, O oh God, both the listener and the speaker. Jesus, anoint us today, O oh God, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. I grew up in a church 
that was Pentecostal, but it was mainstream Trinitarian Pentecostal. And I've heard any number of sermons preached by any number of preachers that addressed the nature and the quote-unquote person of the Holy Ghost. I was taught while I was being raised in church, I was taught that the Holy Ghost is the third person of the so-called Trinity. And that as the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost had a personality and an identity and a function all his own. I want to tell you this prospect was more than a little daunting because we study about God, we study about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, but the Holy Ghost is not a figure or a character that the Word of God really tells us a whole lot about. So if the Holy Ghost were to be someone separate from God the Father, someone separate from Jesus the Christ, then it's a little scary, Tommy, because this is a figure we don't know very well. This is somebody we don't I'm going to tell you, a lot of people today are afraid to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they have no clue, they have no understanding who and what the Holy Ghost is. And that leaves them feeling uncomfortable. That leaves them feeling awkward. We're reading in our primary text today about the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to His disciples just prior to his ascension back into heaven, he appears to his disciples and he speaks to them the words, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets. And in the Psalms, listen, concerning me, hallelujah. Well, a lot of people in the church world today have been made to believe that the Old Testament is about Jehovah God. And it really doesn't say a whole lot at all about this person, Jesus. But that's not what Jesus said. <laughs> He said, all these things must be fulfilled which were written of in the law of Moses. We've talked about that before. There are five books of law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy authored by Moses. He said that were written of me in the law. That were written of me in the prophets. That were written of me in the Psalms. Well, Jesus, what are you talking about? There, there wasn't hardly a mention of you. According to Trinitarian theology, the Son was a mystery. The Son was invisible. The Son, S-O-N, was hidden until He was revealed in the New Testament. We didn't even know God had a Son. Well, first of all, God doesn't have any offspring. God has no need of offspring. God is not a father and God does not have a son in the traditional sense of parental relationships. God had a son in that there was a man born on planet earth who was begotten of the Holy Ghost. And the angel declared to Mary, that holy child that is within thee, said, is begotten of the Holy Ghost, shall be uh, begotten of the Holy Ghost, said, uh, or shall be conceived of the Holy Ghost. And, and the angel said, and he shall be called 
the son of the highest. Why? Because he is a man, he is a male who is born with no earthly father but only God himself as his father. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. The word of God tells us God is a spirit. And that spirit through the vehicle of Mary, the virgin, brought into our world a male child, a son. And that son would be called the Son of God. Meaning, he is God manifested in human form. God cannot have children. God did not engage in sexual intimacy with Mary. This is not uh, the Roman gods. This is not the Greek gods coming down from Olympus and engaging in some intimacy with a woman in order to give birth to a demigod. That is not the transaction that transpired with the man Jesus Christ. No, the Spirit of God, the Word of the Lord tells us, overshadowed Mary. And she conceived in her womb. So God overshadowed her and He merely planted within her the seedling that was to become the male child who was to be called the Son of God. There's so much confusion. There's so much misinformation preached concerning the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, He is spoken of in the Old Testament. Yes, He is spoken of in the law. Yes, He is spoken of in the prophets. Yes, He is spoken of in the Psalms. Hallelujah! Because the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New. Hallelujah! Isaiah the prophet said, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God! And in case you are too dim-witted to follow this. And you want to say, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, oh, he's the mighty God, but Jehovah God's the almighty God. Isaiah went on to say, the everlasting Father. Boy, I'm telling you, God don't make no mistakes. He makes sure he nails that thing shut. He makes sure he's got it down. So you'd have to be really dim-witted not to understand. The same one we call wonderful is the same one we call counselor. The same one we call counselor is the same one we call the mighty God. The same one we call the mighty God is the same one we call the everlasting Father. Hallelujah! And the same one we call the everlasting Father is also called the Prince of Peace. Jesus said in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, it speaks of me. I am the subject, hallelujah, of the scriptures. Glory to God. Certain religious movements have so polluted and diluted the doctrine of Christ. They have reduced Jesus to the most nominal of creatures. They've reduced Jesus to a creation of God. They've reduced Jesus to a glorified angel. They've reduced Jesus to an angel that God caused to be manifested in human form rather than God himself to be manifested in human form. But the Apostle Paul told Timothy, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Seed of angels. Glory to God. Yeah, the angels were there all right. Ooh, 
hallelujah. But God wasn't glorifying an angel. God wasn't suiting an angel up in flesh. Glory to God. God was manifesting himself in flesh. And the angels bore witness to this revelation of himself. They had never seen God like this. <laughs> they had never seen God wearing a human form. Boy, if we mess up who Jesus is, just imagine how badly we mess up who the Holy Ghost is. The Lord said that the Old Testament Scriptures concerned Him, that He was the subject of the Old Testament. When you read the word Scriptures in the New Testament, it always, without exception, is referring to the Old Testament canon. Always. Nowhere in the New Testament will you ever read the word Scriptures and it has anything in the universe to do with the New Testament canon. Nothing. When you read the word Scriptures, it is always speaking up the Old Testament canon. Verse 45, Luke 24. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So obviously, if the Lord now, just before His ascension, is opening the understanding of His disciples and His followers and His apostles so that now all of a sudden they understand the scriptures, the scriptures, the scriptures, then obviously the scriptures already existed. He's not talking about the New Testament, folks. He's talking about the Old Testament. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. All of a sudden, Jesus is just about to ascend. And all of a sudden, Tommy, God opens their understanding. Now, can you imagine following the Lord around for three and a half years of public ministry? And you keep seeing glimpses into His divinity. You keep hearing clues of His divine identity. You, you keep seeing things that sort of suggest and sort of suggest. And you keep hearing things that make you think and make you think. But you don't have an understanding of the Old Testament enough to put it all together. Now the Lord is moments away from ascending and leaving us. And all of a sudden, He opens our understanding. Lord, we hardly knew Thee. Lord, <laughs> Lord, what terrible timing. Just about the time I finally understand who You are. Just about the time I finally get it. About the time that You touch my mind and I'm fully able to grasp and understand who You are in truth. Just at that very moment in time, You have the to leave us. I finally get it. And you're leaving. How many times have we known someone? And we may know them for a while and then something happens and they pass from this life. And they leave us. And we're standing there at the coffin and we're looking at them and we're thinking to ourselves, I hardly knew you. I really didn't have enough time to get to know you, you know. Uh, we feel bad because we loved them, we liked them, we enjoyed them. There was something about them that made us glad they were in our lives. But all of a sudden they're taken too soon and we're standing there feeling robbed because I hardly knew you. I didn't have enough time to really get to know you good. Oh boy, can you imagine?
imagine how the followers of Jesus, the Bible said after the ascent, uh, excuse me, after the resurrection, that the Lord uh, was witnessed alive by more than 500 people at one given time, at one singular time. So there were not just 12 witnesses to the Lord's resurrection. We know that the Lord in our primary text today then told His disciples, He said, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name. Not in the name of Jehovah, not in the name of Allah, not in the name of Buddha, in His name. The Word of God tells us in Acts 4 and 12, For there is no other name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. There is one name that saves. There is one name that redeems. Right. There is one name that delivers. There is one name that will bring healing and the infilling of the Holy Ghost into your life. And that name is Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the revealed name of our God. It is Jehovah is become our Savior. When we use the name Jesus, we are literally acknowledging that Jehovah God Himself became our Savior. That is what the name Jesus means. We're tapping in to power when we use the name Jesus. Because when we use the name Jesus, we are not using the name of some man who lived 2,000 years ago. We're not using a name that God gave to some angel that he put flesh on so he could live life as a normal, average, everyday man and die on a cross. No, 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 no. When we use the name Jesus and we use that name with revelation and with understanding, we literally are using the name of our God and we are using that name with a full understanding and a full acknowledgement that He alone is our Savior. Mm -hmm. I cast demons out. Yes, I'm an old-fashioned Pentecostal preacher. I haven't met a demon yet that can stand up to the name of Jesus when the name of Jesus is spoken with power and authority. And when I'm casting out demons, oftentimes I'll look that demoniac, that person who has within them a demon spirit, I'll look them right in the eye and I'll speak to that demon and I'll say, In the name of your Creator, Jesus, hallelujah! They know I'm right! Glory to God. They know I'm right. They won't argue. They won't resist. Because they know that according to the Apostle John, he was in the world. And he created the world. Not they created the world. He created the world. And the world knew him not. Lord says, repentance and remission of sins are to be preached in my name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Listen to verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Why does he use the language, I send the promise of my Father? Because another person is making the promise. No, 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 no. Because the promise of the Holy Ghost baptism was made by the Father in the Old Testament era. It was made long before God manifested Himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the promise of the Father. God the Father made the promise long before I got here that promise was made. 
A lot of people think the Holy Ghost baptism is a promise that wasn't made until the New Testament. Wrong, 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 wrong. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus was speaking to Jews in his day. And he said to them, Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. I got news for you. There wasn't a Jew one that saw anybody in the Old Testament but God. There wasn't a single Jew in the, that could look at the Old Testament writing and see anybody but Jehovah God. And here Jesus is saying, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. These are they, they are they which testify of me. I want to tell you today, children, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that Jesus promised in our primary text today, verse 49, And behold, the Lord said, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. In the Gospels, the Gospel account of John, I mean, excuse me, in the book of Acts, Luke, the author, states that the Lord used the words, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Lord said in Luke, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. At this point, the Lord leads his disciples, his followers, out as far as Bethany. He lifts his hands up in the air and he blesses them. And as he was blessing them, the word of God said the clouds parted and he was received up into heaven. Hallelujah. And they worshipped him. Don't tell me Jesus isn't God. And they worshipped him. And they worshipped him. This would have been abomination had he been anything short of Jehovah God. Right. and return to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because that's where the Lord told them to tarry. That's where the Lord told them to wait with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost was to be for the disciples and apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ a reintroduction, listen to me children, a reintroduction. They have known him as a man. But they were on the day of Pentecost to be reintroduced to him as the Almighty God. He who as a man had breathed upon them speaking the words, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, was at Pentecost to breathe upon them again, but this time as God from heaven. Hallelujah. We read in John 20, 19-23, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were, uh, were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and say, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. 
And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now look at Acts 2, 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues, with other languages, as the Spirit gave them a trance. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost was a reintroduction of Jesus Christ to his followers who had gathered together and were waiting in the upper room. They had known him as a man, but now they were to know him as the Almighty God. He breathed on them and prophetically spoke the words, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, he was breathing on them again. But this time, not as a man standing in front of them, but as a God reigning in heaven. Hallelujah to God. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Oh, hallelujah. This is a reintroduction. The Holy Ghost was to be no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. He was to return in an invisible, in an invisible form, a spiritual form, rather than a physical form, so that he might remain with us always. But now, without the constraints and the confinements of a flesh and blood body, the Lord would be able to live in us and not merely live with us. Whatever title is used in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in referring to the Spirit of Almighty God, it is speaking also of the Spirit of Christ. In John 14, 16 through 18, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Well, if it's a spirit, how can you see him? Neither knoweth him. Well, if you can't, if you, if, if you can't see him, how can you know him? But ye know him, Jesus said. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Listen to verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. Oh, oh, oh. I will come to you. Hallelujah. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That Holy Ghost that the Trinitarian preacher tells you is some vague third person of the divine Godhead baloney. It is Jesus. It is nothing short of Jesus. It is only Jesus. Hallelujah. God wants to fill you with His power and His presence. He wants to marry His Spirit with your spirit. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to fear. 
It's just me. Jesus says, it's just me. This is a reintroduction. See, you've known me as a man, but now I'm introducing myself to you as God. Hallelujah. Now I'm introducing myself to you in spirit form. See, as a man, for me to be with the church from now until the time arrives that I'm to take the church out of the world, I would have to live for thousands of years while you all are dying and passing on. I would have to continue to live in the flesh for centuries and millennium while you all are passing on and going on. said, no, but He's been with you, but He shall be in you. The best way that I can be with you is by being in you and by being in the church, by literally dwelling in my people, I can be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Thank God. Lord, we hardly knew Thee. Yeah, you had no idea who He was, but He came back on the day of Pentecost and reintroduced Himself as the Spirit of Almighty God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 14, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Wait a minute. Paul, you just said, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Then he says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Are these two separate spirits? Are these two different spirits? Not at all. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Word of God said to wit, that God was in Christ. God is what? A person? No, He is the Spirit. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. The Spirit of God was in the man Jesus Christ. He was both man and God. He was both human and divine. If that Spirit dwell in you, he said, the same Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Paul said, ye are no longer debtors to the flesh. The term debtors here in the Greek literally translate one who owes another, a debtor, one who is held by some obligation or bound by some duty. You don't owe your flesh anything. Hallelujah. When God fills you with the Holy Ghost, you don't know your flesh nothing. Hallelujah. But now he said, but if we do mortify the deeds of the body, through the Spirit we mortify. Well, what does mortify mean? In the Greek, the word that is translated mortify means to put to death, to make to die to destroy or to render extinct. When God fills us with the Holy Ghost, His righteousness is in us. Oh my God. 
we don't owe our flesh anything now. All we owe is God. The only one we have a debt to is God. We therefore serve the Lord. We serve God in the Spirit. But listen, He said, if you mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means the righteousness of God in us by His Spirit renders our natural man dead. Remember I told you before, when God saves us, He doesn't look at us the same way He used to. Remember I told you last week that when God saves us, He doesn't look at us as sinners anymore? Well, there's a reason for that. Because God no longer sees your natural man as even being alive. The Spirit of God within you has literally caused your natural man to be dead in God's eyes. Hallelujah. We mortify the flesh. We mortify the deeds of the flesh by reason of God's Spirit. In Matthew 3, 11 and 12, John the Baptist declares, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. Again, he speaks of himself as being spoken of in the scriptures. He that believeth on me as the scriptures hath said. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on Him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Why was the Holy Ghost not yet given? I'll tell you why. Here's a very simple way to understand this. You ever notice that Clark Kent and Superman were never in the same room at the same time? You always had one or the other. Because they were one and the same person. You couldn't have Superman and Clark Kent in the room at the same time because they were both Superman. They were both Clark Kent. Therefore, you'd have Clark Kent there for a little while. He'd step out. Superman would come in. Well, Jesus was speaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost which was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Before the Holy Ghost could come, Jesus had to physically leave the scene. <laughs> if they were separate people, they could have both been in the room at the same time, but they're not. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glorified. He was not yet glorified. In the Greek, the term that is translated glorified means to make glorious, to adorn with luster, to clothe with splendor, to impart glory to something, to render it excellent. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus was not yet glorified. He had not yet ascended in a glorified form to the throne of God. Hallelujah. But once He did, then and only then could the promise of the Holy Ghost come. Why? Because Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. 
and there are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severely, severally, as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Lord, we hardly knew thee. Yeah, that's why I came back in spirit form to reintroduce myself to you. <laughs> See, I just opened your understanding a few minutes ago. I just, I just opened your understanding. You finally got it. You finally understand, according to the scriptures, who I am. Well, now that you understand who I am, here I am. Hallelujah. Superman's left the room and Clark Kent's back or vice versa. Glory to God. In Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7 but when the fullness of the time was come God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth, listen, the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son than an heir of God through Christ. The Spirit of His Son. The Word of God tells us that God, in order to bring us into adoption, in order to make us part of His family, that He's put the Spirit of His Son in us. For by one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. So is the Spirit of God one thing and the Spirit of His Son another? I think not. Hallelujah. Why does he use the language he sent forth the Spirit of his Son? It's easy. He's talking about, he's, he's adopting us. He's making us his Son. So bet, what better way of making us his Son than giving us the same Spirit that the only begotten Son had within him? Hallelujah. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Amen. It's pretty simple. 1 Corinthians 3.16 the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Apostle Paul writes, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we're seeing Spirit of God, we're seeing the Lord is that Spirit, 
Luke chapter 11, 9 through 13, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread, of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So we see the term Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 3.16. We see the Spirit of the Lord in 2 Corinthians 3.17. We see the term Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 11 verse 13. Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. That we should be the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, after that ye believed, listen, after that ye believed, it didn't happen when you believed, it happened after you believed, what happened? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest the term earnest here literally means the down payment of our inheritance. Listen, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You remember I taught a couple weeks ago about redemption? And about how redemption is not yet complete and therefore, well, that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said the Holy Ghost baptism is the down payment on God's purchase of us. Until the redemption of his purchased possession. Till he redeems his purchased possession. Let's continue. I'm almost done. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, when I preach stuff, I don't give you every scripture under the sun that deals with that subject, or else we'd be in church all day and all night, and I'd never finish. I try to tell people that have been in our church and I try to teach them how to teach and how to preach and how to, you know, I say you, you don't have to give everything all at one time. You build on it over the course of weeks and over the course of months. I talked about redemption and how redemption works. Now you're hearing scriptures that are helping you to understand exactly what I said is so. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Almost done. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. My Baptist friend, you are as wrong as wrong can be when you erroneously, falsely believe that you received the Holy Ghost when you believe. Wrong. This passage tells us the Samaritans had already received the Word of God. They were already believers. But as yet, they had not re received the Holy Ghost. So therefore, the apostles sent men to them for the express purpose of helping them to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Ghost is not an automatic thing. The Holy Ghost is something that we must allow God to... Uh, this is something we must allow the Lord to do in our lives after we have believed the Gospel. Let's continue. Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 47. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Lest today any false teachers or deceivers try to use semantics to suggest that the terms Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of His Son, etc. are not in fact all referring to the one and the same Spirit. Let us put this lie to rest with this simple passage. John chapter 4 verse 24. Jesus speaking, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is the biggest word in this passage is the smallest word in this passage. God is a spirit. God is one singular spirit. We read it before. All the gifts of the spirit are imparted to the people of God by the self same spirit. Everything that is done by God is done by the one same spirit. We don't believe in channeling the dead. We don't believe in saints speaking to the church. We don't believe. I knew a charismatic Catholic church in Connecticut many years ago when I was pastoring my first church or even before that. They literally would have quote unquote prophecy in their church and they claimed it was the Virgin Mary speaking to the church. Wrong. 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 The gifts of the Spirit are administered by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God alone. Only God, no other spirit, no other person will ever speak to or through the church but God. Everything is done by the one same spirit. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of His Son. All of these terms refer simply to Jesus. Jesus. The Holy Ghost baptism, my friend, is a reintroduction to the one whom we can only know partially without this experience. When the Spirit of the Lord comes in, we are reintroduced to the Lord as the Divine One, whom we have only known up until then as God manifest in the flesh. My question today is, have you been reintroduced? Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost baptism is just Jesus reintroducing Himself. You guys have known me as a man walking among you. You've known me as someone living with you. But now I need to reintroduce myself because now I'm the Almighty God. I'm no longer dwelling among you. I'm living in you. Hallelujah. I'm no longer working in your presence, I am now working through you. I'm literally imparting my power and my authority into your life by my Spirit. 
That's why the Word of God said, but ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. Because why? Because God is literally investing Himself. We wind up with the power of God. We wind up with the authority of God. That's why when a Holy Ghost filled believer looks a demon in the eye and says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. That demon ain't stupid enough to argue with a Holy Ghost filled child of God who speaks with the authority of God alone. That demon doesn't even see the preacher. That demon doesn't even see the believer. Do you know who that demon sees? That demon sees Jesus. Because Jesus is the Spirit that dwells within us. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we hardly knew Thee. But thank God You came back and reintroduced Yourself as the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Would you value?